Well, folks, I have a very, very good show today. I have a great guest. Sharon Clemens is with us. And Sharon has a book out on the Beatles. It's titled Forbidden Fruit. And Sharon said the book came out, I guess, about a month ago, Sharon? Yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, and she's going to take us through her research. And uh, before we started the show, we discussed how her research goes beyond just the typical conspiracy around the Beatles, which would be um, Paul is dead or the replacement of Paul McCarty. So uh, Sharon, welcome. And I'm very happy to have you on the show. Thank you. <laughs> and what I'd like to do to get started, because this is always of interest to the audience, is for you to give a little background about your journey, how you ended up looking into the McCartney and Beatles conspiracy. Well, I was a big Beatle maniac in elementary school. And um, <laughs> And really, I got into it because of my older sister, who was also a Beatle maniac. But I was still in elementary school when Sergeant Peppers came out. And because, you know, I was a big fan of Paul McCartney, I knew that didn't look like him on the cover. But I was so young and, the, you know, nobody was admitting that that wasn't Paul McCartney. And I really couldn't understand it. And um, finally, I decided, well, after hearing that he was admitting to taking LSD, I just decided, well, maybe drugs just ruin your looks because I couldn't explain it any other way. Well, after elementary school, I didn't worry about the Beatles anymore. You know, I grew up, have a life and didn't think about it too much. But about 16 years ago, there uh, began to be disclosure materials that were released that talked about Paul being replaced. And some of them were pretty obscure, but eventually one of them came out called The Memoirs of Billy Shears, which your audience probably knows pretty well, but just for those who don't know it, um, the, the Memoirs of Billy Shears is, and shall I describe it? Is that a good idea or do you want to? Okay, got it back. I was going to say it it's back. your show. You go wherever you want to go, talk about okay. whatever you want to talk about. Okay, well, this book that came out uh, the Memoirs of Billy Shears is supposed to be, it claims to be based on material that was given to the person who put it together, Thomas Harriet, that was given to him by Sir Paul McCartney himself. And the memoirs claim that the person that the world knows as Sir Paul McCartney is actually a man named William Shepard. And he's known by his, uh, by many names, actually, because he's played under different names. But Billy Shears is one of his stage names. So um, he, since he is not allowed to tell the press or to admit publicly that he is not Paul McCartney, he uh, takes the approved routes by the people who control the Beatles and uh, control that organization. And he is able to put some of the truth about the Beatles and himself in poems or lyrics or novels. So the memoirs of Billy Shears is a novel, but uh, he claims at the end that it's basically nonfiction, although some fiction had to be added for legal purposes. But realistically, uh, my book doesn't rely on any facts that are in there. Um, and I don't think, I think that anything that's in there needs to be proven, even though much of it is provably true. So um, the reason that this book inspired me, even though I don't rely on any facts that are in it, is there were really three things. The first thing I, I learned from the book and was able to prove to myself was that the last six albums of the Beatles were all um, con concerned with Paul's story. And uh, the book claimed that Paul was dead and that that was the focus of all six of those albums. And it's certainly not, I don't think, obvious on the surface at all. But eventually I was able to prove that to myself. And then um, I was also able to prove to myself that it wasn't just the albums. It was the two movies that they released, Magical Mystery Tour and then Yellow Submarine. And also there were six videos released in association with Magical Mystery Tour. And all of them have um, interesting information about Paul and what happened to him. And there also is information on the album covers. So all of that material is important. Then a second item that I could prove to myself was that 
there are just hundreds and hundreds of clues embedded in all of these works. And of course, having lived through the 1969 Paul is Dead uh, issue, which is when Paul is Dead made the news all over the place, and uh, everybody learned there were clues that Paul was dead, and then the media immediately said it was all hoaxed. Well, so I had always been aware that there were Paul's dead clues, but I had no idea that there were huge numbers of clues and that they were interconnected and they, they tell a complete story. So uh, that's something I was able to prove to myself. And then a third thing that I was able to prove to myself was it really relates to the idea that the Beatles were involved with Satanism. And in the back of the book, uh, Memoirs claims that the part about Satanism in, in the book is definitely, quote unquote, the truth. And what it says about Satanism is that the Beatles got into Satanism because of the Illuminati. And uh, it was a specific brand of Satanism, that being that of Aleister Crowley, who the book defines as the father of modern Satanism. And from everything I've learned, that's pretty much true. So, but that they were into this, not because they wanted to worship Satan, but because they were led to understand that that was the way that they could access the Illuminati's professional networks to further their career. And then another important thing it says with respect to that is that the Masons actually sponsored the Beatles for the Illuminati. So, uh, and then it alerts you to all the album cover symbolism, which deals with these issues. So again, I didn't take any of that at face value. You really have to prove things to yourself in order to understand whether they're true or not. And But you can look at those album covers and you can see they're just covered with occult symbolism, uh, Illuminati symbolism, Masonic symbolism, all sorts of references to Aleister Crowley and his religion, Thelema, and his dogma and his organizations, the OTO, the AA, and also mind control symbolism. But being alerted to all the symbolism was really a key. Um, and that's that turned out to be very important because the themes that are on the album covers actually show up in the clues and they make the clues recognizable. So I wouldn't have never recognized these clues before if I had not been alerted to that fact. So with those three things in mind that I seem to be able to prove to myself were true, I began on this odyssey. <laughs> so... Uh, I, I, and I, just to give an example, actually, of when did you start sharing? Do you just back up a second? When did you like you were aware of the uh, of the conspiracy? But when did you start to really dig in and to uh, uncover you know, all of these clues? Because what I tell people is once you see it, you cannot unsee it. No, you cannot unsee it. Yeah. And not only that, but once you see it in detail, I mean, you, you just can't deny anything. I mean, you can deny certain facts, but you cannot deny that Paul was replaced and I think after you hear this story, you'll realize there's a lot of it you absolutely can't deny. So anyway, I was listening to I Am the Walrus on a long trip out west, <laughs> and I hadn't listened to it in a long time. And um, because if you've ever driven across West Texas, you know it can be a little bit tedious. And uh, so I, I just was sitting there as the passenger thinking about this. And so when I got back, I looked up I Am the Walrus and started looking at those lyrics, which have never made sense. But I began to focus in on the words in the lyrics instead of the lyrics themselves. And um, I began to see a pattern. And um, that pattern made me do some research. I, I, it appeared to me that the words there seemed to be referencing a place. But while I was trying to figure this out, I also was paying attention to the song Glass Onion because Glass Onion is a follow-up song to I Am The Walrus where John explains the clues, uh, or I'm sorry, he ex tries to help people understand that there are clues and that you know they need to pay attention to get those clues. Here's another clue for you all. That's right, the right. walrus with Paul. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, so he alerts people in Glass Onion that the Beatles have been giving out clues and he's now going to give us another one the walrus is paul but that's that's very interesting because the title of his walrus song is i am the walrus which so that's the same thing as saying i am paul which tells you that i am the walrus is a song about paul and um once it's apparent that i am the walrus is about paul then 
one line in the song begins to make sense. And that line is, man, you've been a naughty boy. You let your face grow long. So I, I was wondering if we could show pictures two and three, because I want to demonstrate why those of us who recognize that he's been replaced can say that Paul's face grew long. That's the first picture um, mm -hmm. you wanted me to bring up, Sharon. So what is it about this picture you wanted to talk about? The reason I wanted people to see this picture is it is a picture of the official Paul in 1965. And this picture was taken when the Beatles were presented with MBEs at, in October of 1965. And there were a huge number of pictures taken that day. So it is uh, one of the most reliable pictures of the original Paul. And or at least the person who is officially the original Paul, because we, as we know, there were doubles that were used for him occasionally. Right. But um, this is just kind of a point of reference because you can see he's very youthful, he's very cute, and he's very natural looking. And then I wanted to compare that to an interesting picture that I found of Billy in 1967, Billy being Paul's replacement. Okay, let's go there. Let me mm -hmm. see. Okay. So is this the picture here you're referring to? Yes. Now, um, you'll see all sorts of pictures of Billy the Replacement from uh, late 1966 on. But this picture was particularly interesting because it was, this is the one on the right side. The, uh, Paul is on the left and then Billy is on, Billy the Replacement is on the left side. Right. And what's so interesting is most of the time that pictures are taken of Billy, he has fillers in his face so that his face looks rounder like Paul's. And there's heavy editing also of the pictures and of the videos. So, for example, if you watch the Hello Goodbye video, you're going to see Paul with pretty much a round face, not exactly round like Paul's, but very close. But this is a picture taken of Billy during the recording of Fool on the Hill in 1967. And it's a, apparently a rare one that slipped out because it uh, definitely shows his different shaped face, which yeah. is longer and pointier. Yeah, he has that elongated jawline. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh-huh. Yeah. So I was just showing that for comparison. Clearly, you could see that. Mm -hmm. Well, you should be able to see, folks, <laughs> <laughs> that these are two different people. Yes, they're two different people. Two mm -hmm. different people. All right, so but you, you can want... be very compu uh, confused by all the photo fakery involved. And so speaking of photo fakery, so this is the, this is one of three pictures that were allegedly taken on August 11th, 1966 during the American tour. And I'm just showing this so you get an idea of how much photo fakery there is in the pictures of the Beatles on this last tour. And almost all the fakery involves Paul. So... First, we have this picture and you can see the Beatles and you see that George and Paul and John are very similar in height and that Paul is kind of slight. He's um, really just a natural person there uh, looking cute or at least looking natural and very close in height to John. And there's a reason why I'm pointing that out. So the second photo was allegedly also taken on August 11th, 1966 at a different place in the airport. Want me to go to the other photo? Mm -hmm, to the second photo. And here we see the Beatles, only Billy's face has been inserted into Paul's. And when, when you look at it up close, you can see the crop line, but that's clearly a different face. It's an older and a kind of a harder look with, even though he's smiling, but um, I'm pointing this out because not only is Billy's face suddenly appearing in the pictures, but look again at the height of John and Paul and George. It's all very similar. And But on the third photo, also taken the same day, we suddenly see Billy and he is much taller. <laughs> and the, the obvious reason for this, if you know that Billy is much taller than Paul, is that there's this attempt to confuse people about how tall Paul really is, what his face really looks like. Right. There's just all this photo fakery on the tour. So that was done for some reason, and we'll discuss that, but I just wanted to give those examples. It's funny, when I 
saw these images when you sent them over, one of the things I noticed um, going back to the previous uh, photo, uh -huh. it does look doctored. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And if you look up close, you can definitely see a crop line across the hair. And you can also see it um, in the face. Yes, right where you're pointing. A little something but, right here. And even George uh -huh. looks a little weird to me. Yeah. George looks like he has been edited. Yeah. Well, this goes to what I've been saying for a long time, as you, as you know. Um, they have been doctoring photos for a long time. Mm-hmm. So, okay, yeah, I'm going back to the other one. Okay. Yeah. Right. Well, it looks like his head was just <laughs> photoshopped in. Yeah, and it looks like maybe because of the suitcase, they were able to make him look much taller. Yeah. By just, you know, cutting up the image. So. Very interesting. Anyway, back to Glass Onion. <laughs> okay, did you want um, me to go to picture seven or? Oh, let's see. Um. Uh, okay. Oh, not yet. Not, not yet. yet. We'll, we'll All right. So we won't go to that one. So we'll yeah. stop sharing. Okay. There we go. We're back. <laughs> okay. Hi. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So we're back to Glass Onion. A third thing that we I learned from Glass Onion is that uh, John seems to keep alerting us to the a place. He says things like, um, well, I told you about Strawberry Fields. Here's another place you can go. I told you about Fool on the Hill, here's another place you can be. So as I began looking at the individual words in Glass Onion and comparing with I Am the Walrus, I began to realize that these two songs are talking about the same place. And they are both talking about Seattle, Washington. Okay. And so um, I this is what I illustrate in the book, among other things. But um, I Am the Walrus is primarily a collection of word clues that form a collage or a mosaic uh, that paint a portrait of Seattle in the 1960s. And while there are some statements such as that Billy was replaced, but, which is what they're saying when they are saying his face grew long, uh, most of the song is just a mosaic of clues to locations in Seattle. And these are locations of businesses or um, landmarks or tourist attractions. And I identified about 25 of them, but I don't, I will be surprised if I got them all. I'm sure there are probably more. But um, anyway, not only are there a large number of these clues to locations in Seattle in I Am the Walrus, but that song, which came out in 1967, was followed by Glass Onion in 1968, sorry, 1968, which has another list of Seattle clues. And then Come Together in 1969, which has another list, an even longer list of Seattle clues. And then there are clues sprinkled all around other songs that point to Seattle. In fact, there are three songs that I found, there may be more, that are just one big Seattle clue. Okay, so so you your research says that Paul died in the United States then? He died in the United States. Okay. okay. And um, so... I found, and you don't believe John's uh, comment that he just put words together because they sounded good? No, I don't. <laughs> I don't think you will either after you read the book. No, I, <laughs> I, didn't, I didn't believe it when he first said it. <laughs> <laughs> no, no. I don't believe the story that I am the walrus is just deliberate nonsense. Right, right. I've never believed that, but I certainly never realized how much there was in it. So I found more than Seattle clues, and I'm definitely sure I, ha I you know, haven't found them all. But um, the question is, if I am the walrus is saying that Paul was replaced because suddenly his face is no longer. And, and there are all these Seattle clues. It suggests that his replacement must be connected to Seattle in some way. And then in addition to that, Glass Onion seems to be saying he is deceased. And the reason for that is that it ends in a dirge. And that's only obviously a hint. But the clues throughout these songs, both um, in Magical Mystery Tour, where I Am the Walrus is from, uh, and then uh, the later clues from the later years, 
become more and more explicit. And they not only tell you that Paul is dead, but they tell you how, where, when, and why Paul died. It's, I mean, it's amazing how much detail there is. So as it turns out, Seattle is the place where Paul's story, the story of his death and replacement actually begins. And it's the first of several critical places that are embedded in the puzzle and the story underlying the puzzle that the Beatles put through all of their works. And um, there are multiple locations. They're all in Washington State. And uh, it, it is very interesting how this uh, folds out from Seattle. But um, I, I just found the fact that there were all these Seattle clues, first of all, to be very interesting for several reasons. And one is that some of the researchers, and, and I know you probably know who they are, have long said that he disappeared after the Seattle concert. But uh, I didn't really know why that was because I, I knew they were looking at pictures and I didn't think pictures were reliable. So I really didn't understand why they were saying that. And uh, a lot of people just find that to be totally unbelievable because after all, the Beatles did show up for the last two concerts on their American tour after the Seattle concerts. So, uh, it, you know, it kind of seemed unbelievable. And then um, but well, I think the they said they, that they hadn't they hadn't seen them. He, they hadn't seen Paul, I guess, it, when they were looking yeah. at the images after mm -hmm. um, the, the, uh, after, the last after concert. The That's right. Yeah, right. And um, the Seattle concerts, the last two were on uh, the 25th of August, 1966. So um, that the fact that there were people who were claiming that he had disappeared then and the fact that there was all that photo fakery. Uh, in the photos from that tour were two of the things that alerted me to, well, maybe there's really something to this. Um, and uh, if we could show that last picture, I wanted to give you an example. In all the photo fakery, all the pictures, for example, from the last two concerts show some evidence of fakery. And um, in most of the pictures, for example, on Paul, you can see some sort of crop mark or shading that's very suspicious. But I found this one picture <laughs> from the Dodger Stadium. That is alleged to be Paul McCartney at um, on stage playing at the Dodger Stadium concert, which was the second to last concert, the first one after Seattle. And uh, I don't know if they just missed this one and or just really messed up the... Uh, photo fakery in this one. I don't know what happened, but I don't know who that is. I certainly don't recognize that as anything like Paul McCartney. No, so, his, his face looks heavy to me, like uh -huh. around the jaw and the neck area. Mm -hmm. And the eyes don't look anything like his. Yeah. I don't know who, yeah. you know, what that is. Okay. So that's an interesting anomaly. And then uh, another thing is that at the next concert, which was the final concert in San Francisco at Candlestick Park, one of the um, security guards gave an interview and said that a double had shown up for Paul McCartney, who was much taller than John Lennon. And as you just saw, the real Paul McCartney is not taller than John Lennon. And uh, so this was very interesting um, because- So who was the source? Um, um, this is with the uh, security Joey guard? Armato. Joey okay. Armato, okay. who was security guard on the 29th at Candlestick Park. And then uh, at that same concert, uh, the opening group for the Beatles uh, was the Remains. And the, the one of the uh, key singers, in fact, I think he's the lead singer in that group is Barry Tashian. And Barry Tashian also gave an interview about how strange that concert was. He said that their stage was put far away from the audience, much farther than usual. And it made them feel very isolated and he just, didn't really understand why that had happened. And of course, that's particularly interesting since Memoirs claims that at the beginning of August in 1966, a recording was made of John and Paul. This was in the first week of August and that it was played at the end of the tour. Now, why would that there be any reason to play unless uh, people were on stage lip syncing to their recording? And, um, you know, so whether what is in memoirs are, is true. The fact that the stage was put so far away was definitely for a reason. I mean, obviously 
the players couldn't be seen that well. And maybe that was because they were lip syncing, but it was probably even more so because makes it harder to there identify. Were some strangers, mm -hmm, there were some strangers on. <laughs> anyway, <laughs> this doesn't prove anything. Yeah. This is just alerting me to, well, wait a minute. Why are there all these anomalies? It's certainly possible that certain uh, certain things might have happened in Seattle or after Seattle because there are just too many anomalies that haven't been explained. So from there, I noticed, well, the Beatles stayed in downtown Seattle at the what then was called the Edgewater Inn, and um, it's now called the Edgewater Hotel. And that is very interesting because when I look at the location of the Edgewater Inn, which is right on the water in uh, downtown Seattle, I began to see that a lot of these Seattle clues in I Am the Walrus point to something that the Beatles were likely to have seen from just being in downtown Seattle, or else they were likely to have heard about. So if it's okay, I'd like to go through some of the clues that I found that point the maps. to... Excuse me? Did you want to go through the maps? Uh, well, I, I do, and just starting in just a second. Oh, I'm sorry. sorry. I thought you wanted me to screen share something you sent me. No, but you want to go well, through... Well, actually, actually, putting uh, up map one would be a good idea. Okay. Let me and then we can start with that. All right. Is that it, Sharon? That's it. Okay, great. So um, this is a map of the core of downtown Seattle. And um, so I just wanted to point out some places near the Beatles Hotel that seem to be referenced in the clues. So starting with the chorus, which most people know is, I am the Eggman, they are the Eggmen, I am the Walrus. Well, the word walrus as a clue was the easiest thing to find because it refers to the Arctic Club Hotel, which is also known as the Walrus Building. And can you see on the map where the Arctic Club Hotel is right in the middle? Right in the middle here. Model? Yep. It does show up? Okay. Yep. Okay, good. Okay, and it's referred to as the Walrus Building because... The facade of the hotel is lined at the third floor level with 27 terracotta walrus heads. So it's a very important landmark in Seattle. So I wondered if the Eggman and the Eggman were nearby. And I found the Eggman, and they show up on map two. Uh, there, I found the Eggman at 84 Pine Street at a place known as the Jim Egg Market. And what this facility was was a place where the farmers from nearby chicken ranches would gather and sell their eggs. And it was a very important place in the 1960s because this was the place you went to get the freshest eggs available. It wasn't like you could just run anywhere and find the freshest eggs. So this is the uh, this is showing 84 Pine Street and the Jim Egg Market, which is where the egg men would gather. So 84 Pine Street, folks, to center left. Yes. On mm -hmm. the map. Mm hmm Yes. So uh, then uh, I knew that the Eggman must be somewhere nearby if my hunch was correct. And um, so I found it about seven blocks away. And if you want to sh show map three, it shows the location of the Eggman. Okay. Now, uh, the Eggman well, is, is kind of interesting story. The Eggman is located or was located in those days at 700 Pike Street. And this was called the Golden Egg Cafe. It was a little short order cafe and it advertised that it would fix eggs for you any way you wanted. That was a specialty and that's what it's, it did. You know, it wasn't, didn't have a lot of variety. It was just eggs any way you wanted them. So now a short order cook that specializes in eggs is often called an egg man. But the owner of this little restaurant had a much bigger reason to be called the Eggman because he had placed right above his tiny little cafe a giant golden egg, advertising that he sold eggs. And um, he, it said on there, Golden Egg Cafe. And because of the visual prominence of this huge egg on this tiny restaurant, people would see it driving around downtown and it became a minor landmark at the time. So, and actually I reference a video of it, which, uh, so that people can see for themselves what it looked like in my book. 
Well, uh, then I wanted to pull up map four and okay. um, show how close these places were. The Edgewater Hotel is where the Beatles stayed. It, again, it was called the Edgewater Inn, but it shows you how close the hotel on the waterfront downtown was to these little places. So with the Golden Egg Cafe and the Jim Egg Market and the Walrus Building, you've got the ingredients for the chorus to I Am the Walrus, which again is about an egg man, some egg men, and a walrus. So I thought, well, couldn't that just be coincidence? I mean, it might seem like it at this point, point, but it's not <laughs> because there are so many clues pointing to locations nearby in downtown. And uh, the next ones I found were in the bridge of the song. And you probably recall the bridge of the song uh, goes sitting in an English garden waiting for the sun. And then right. if the sun don't come, you get a tan from standing in the English rain. And just like the Eggman, the Eggmen and the Walrus were critical words that were forming clues as to locations. Uh, the same thing is happening in the bridge of the song. And the critical words here are English and garden and rain. Now, if you were looking at this bridge in terms of just trying to figure out the lyrics, you might think an English garden was a garden in England or maybe an English style garden, but that's not what John's referring to. He's referring to a very specific garden in downtown Seattle, or actually it's just on the outside of downtown. And uh, it was developed by a man named English. And it is the Carl S. English Botanical Garden. Carl S. English was the landscape architect for the US Army Corps of Engineers who developed this garden on the grounds of the Chittenden Locks when they were built in uh, 1911. And he spent 43 years creating a fabulous garden, designing it and then tending it and replanting it over all those years. And so the next map shows you where that English garden is. There it is. Uh, right up at the top, the top red mark. Top so, center, uh, folks. Excuse me? I'm talking to the audience. I said the top center. Oh, oh. Okay. I want to yeah. point their eyes in the right direction, mm -hmm. Sharon. <laughs> yeah, okay. So that's the English garden. Then uh, this garden is only about five, five and a half miles away from the Beatles Hotel. But if you're traveling back or forth and you get bored on this short trip, you can always stop off at uh, and a very interesting place, 2820 Thorndike Avenue West. And the next map shows that location. There it is. And uh, so if you were bored, you can stop off here and find yourself a pornographic priestess because this is the Horizon Lodge of the OTO. And that's why pornographic priestess is also mentioned in I Am The Wars. Oh, okay. 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 Let's venture on down and look at map seven, which shows the Seattle Aquarium, which is just south of the Beatles Hotel and the Eggman, the Eggman, and the Walrus. And the reason that we are going to the Seattle Aquarium is because this is where we can find an elementary penguin. But the elementary penguin does not refer to a penguin. The Seattle Aquarium is one of two places where you can see a very important bird called the tufted puffin. The tufted puffin is a bird that is known as a parrot of the sea because of its beautiful coloring during the breeding season. At least I think it's beautiful. Some people might think it's tacky, but I don't. <laughs> anyway, you can see it at the aquarium and you can also take a boat out into uh, the sound, to Puget Sound and beyond to see these beautiful birds, although they were much more plentiful back at the time that the Beatles wrote this song. But this uh, bird is a big tourist attraction and not just for bird lovers. It's just really an interesting and beautiful bird. And so anyway, the reason that elementary penguin is referring to this is because penguin is actually referring to the British publishing house, Penguin Books, and they have an elementary division named Puffin. So that's elementary penguin is definitely a clue to the Puffin birds that you can see on a trip to Seattle. 
Wow, very interesting, Sharon. So then we go down, and um, I, I wondered about why Edgar Allan Poe shows up in the lyrics to I Am the Walrus. Yeah. And, of course, like a lot of people, when I hear Edgar Allan Poe, the first thing I think of is the raven. So I began looking around Seattle for something that evoked a raven, and it wasn't hard to find. And we can find it on uh, map eight. It is the Pioneer Square totem pole. And the interesting thing about this pole, totem pole is it's all about the raven. Uh, it was stolen by leading citizens of Seattle from a Klingit village in um, Alaska in 1899. And it was raised in Pioneer Square that year. And even though it was stolen, it become, became a source of pride to the citizens of Seattle. The Klingit people, and, and I found at least six different pronunciations of this, so I'm, I'm just going to go with the one that I think is closest, which uh, is Klingit. And um, they are one of the indigenous cultures of Alaska, and they have two lineages. One is the raven, and one is the eagle. And this particular pole belonged to people of the raven lineage. And as such, there is a raven sitting on top of the pole, and underneath the raven are carvings that relate to three legends about the raven. So that was definitely why Edgar Allan Poe is in there. And then <laughs> we come to Similina Pilcher climbing the Eiffel Tower. Now that was a very tough one to figure out, but I think I finally got it. <laughs> in fact, I know I finally got it. Um, but it, I had to give myself a little history lesson on Seattle in order to get it. And uh, one of the things that I learned about, I was thinking, you know, Seattle is such an important port city. Certainly there have to be some clues here that relate to Seattle as a port, maybe the piers or terminals or something. And uh, so I went back and studied that and particularly looking at Seattle in the 1960s. And I found something very interesting. I found that just south of the downtown area, there were two very important terminals located on the East Duwamish Riverway. And um, we do have a picture of that, that's uh, map nine. And uh, so what's so interesting is that is it, when you see on this map, it says, uh, let me see if I can see, 2917 East Marginal Way South. Well, that was the location in the 1960s of one of two terminals, and the other one was very close to it. The first terminal was the Hanford Street Grain Terminal, and that was important because um, it had grain elevators that would elevate grain and grain derivatives into storage. So this would include things like wheat and wheat derivatives, such as semolina, and of course semolina is mentioned in I Am the Walrus. It would also include things like corn and cornflakes, and of course cornflakes are mentioned in I Am the Walrus, and then also rice and some other items. But when these grains were being elevated into storage, and particularly some of the derivatives when they were being elevated into storage, because these old facilities were very inefficient, a lot of the time some of the product would fall loose and be blown by the wind, especially something light like cornflakes. Uh, that's why cornflakes could be found in those days in Seattle in unexpected places. And that's why George, uh, not George, John refers to sitting on a cornflake in I Am the Walrus. And so um, the second terminal, which is just slightly south, was the Spokane Street Terminal. They Again, the two were very close together. And this Spokane Street Terminal was a coal storage terminal. It was seven stories high and it stored ice and fish. And in addition to crab, it would store uh, some of the very small fish like sardines or pilchard. And I did not know this, but the pilchard are considered the sardines of the Pacific Northwest. And so that's why they are in I Am the Walrus. And um, that uh, again, you would see if you were driving by these things being elevated into storage. And so that was, it was kind of an interesting thing. And so what does all this have to do with Semolina and Pilchard climbing the Eiffel Tower? Well, 
when the Beatles got to Seattle, they would have probably taken Route 99, which ran from the airport all the way up to their hotel. And you, I don't know if you can see on this map, but you are looking at Route 99. Right here, the blue line? Yeah. Yep. And towards the bottom of the map, you would, that's where you would be if you were driving up from the airport. And when you were driving up from the airport, you would see these two old terminals with grains and fish being elevated into storage. And you would see them against the backdrop of the Space Needle. And you can see on there where the Space Needle is and how if you're down at the bottom of the map and you're driving, you're going to see those two facilities again with items being elevated into storage against the backdrop of the Space Needle. Well, of course, in the 1960s, the Space Needle was often referred to as America's Eiffel Tower. It's, you know, it's still sometimes referred to that, but it was very common back in the 1960s. So um, let's say a person with a creative mind and possibly like John Lennon uh, is driving up on 99, driving north, and off to the left, he sees these facilities that have grains and fish being elevated into storage against the backdrop of the Space Needle. I can see how to a very creative mind, it would seem like Semolina and Pilchard really were climbing up the Eiffel Tower as these things are being elevated. So, uh, you know, you can certainly put a different interpretation, but that is what I see. <laughs> No, it's it's very impressive. Um, now I have I was as you were going through this, I was thinking that uh, I, it made me question whether John had anything to do with the lyrics and I am the walrus because it would seem to me that um, if I put it together with your research that whoever wrote the lyrics had to have a pretty good understanding of all this mm -hmm. in order to put the lyrics together to tell the story. And I was thinking to myself, well, did John Lennon spend enough time in Seattle to have that level of knowledge? You know, so anyway, um, no, I think this is great. And I don't, you know, doing the work myself, Sharon, I know that it's like a big, giant puzzle. Mm -hmm. It is. And I'm not saying that John Lennon didn't write it because someone could have provided him with all this information right, and then he right, turned it right. into a song. Right. I'm just saying that the lyrics themselves, putting it all together, somebody had to have a pretty intricate knowledge uh, of putting the lyrics together. So it stepped through what you just took us through. That that mm -hmm. was my, that's my point. Mm -hmm. But uh, I think it's fabulous. Well, there are more clues, more Seattle clues than I am the walrus, but I thought it might be interesting to look at the, then the next two songs that John put out that had a long list of Seattle clues. Uh, and the, of course, the next one in 1968 is Glass Onion. And the interesting thing about Glass Onion is that while I Am the Walrus is mentioning all these locations around Seattle, uh, the Seattle clues that are in Glass Onion all are almost all refer to industries around Seattle and that area. And the first one, of, um, not surprisingly, is in the title, Glass Onion, because in the 1960s, Glass art was becoming very, very popular, and the number of glass artists in Seattle was growing, and their works began to be known around the world. And um, I was just thinking of the man who is probably the most popular glass artist from Seattle, and that would be Dave Tahuli. Okay. And uh, he has works all around the world, and they are just gorgeous. And, and some of the other artists have beautiful works. So Seattle was definitely becoming known in the 1960s as the place for glass art. And glass onions in particular were a very popular subject because in Washington state, the state vegetable is the Walla Walla onion. And um, so Dave Tuhuli has a very famous exhibit called Walla Wallas, which are glass onions floating in a pool. And he did an exhibit in Bellevue, which is a suburb of Seattle, in 1968, where it was his first really uh, elaborate um, exhibit for glass blowing. And it became very popular and got a lot of publicity. And the song Glass Onion was recorded just two months later. And I don't think that's a coincidence. So <laughs> um, anyway, um, 
that the onions or the glass onions are only the first clue. Another clue that points to an industry around Seattle is tulips. And then the line about the bent back tulips. Well, that's referencing the tulip farming industry. And it turns out that the area around Seattle is a wonderful area for growing tulips. And they've been grown there for almost 200 years now. And the largest producer of tulips in the United States is just about 60 miles plus outside of Seattle. And that's in Mount Washington. I'm sorry, Mount Vernon, Washington. So they grow very well there. And every year there is a big festival called the Skagit Valley Tulip Festival. And so it's a very important uh, industry there. And uh, a really a, a wonderful industry because so many people gathered there to see all these beautiful tulips and other flowers too. Then there's another line. You can basically pick any line in this. Um, this one is fixing a hole in the ocean, trying to make a dovetail joint. Yeah. Well, the hole in the ocean is referring to the octopus hole, which is a conservation area that is on Hood Canal. And Hood Canal is an extension of Puget Sound. And Puget Sound is an inlet of the Pacific Ocean. So technically, the octopus hole is a hole within an ocean. But uh, then, and, and I guess this line is alluding to the fact that we're trying to fix this hole by trying to make a dovetail joint. So what that's referring to is the fact that in, in the 1960s, probably Seattle was most known for its lumber industry before the tech industry really took off. And um, a dovetail joint joins two pieces of lumber without using any mechanical fasteners. And because of that lumber industry, another industry grew up, which was the furniture industry. And there were schools uh, that opened up all over the place on the basics of furniture making, some of them in the colleges and some private businesses. But um, they would teach you how to make a dovetail joint. And that's what John is referring to in that song. So there are plenty of other clues to Seattle in Glass Onion, but let's go on to Come Together because there is an even longer list of clues in Come Together. One of my favorite yeah. Beatles songs. <laughs> well, again, we want to just focus on the words in the lyrics. And uh, come together not only refers to businesses and locations, but it branches out and starts talking about uh, famous people from Seattle, famous incidents that occurred in Seattle, and one big famous crime that occurred in Seattle, which is very interesting. So starting with some of the more mundane clues, we find Coca-Cola. Well, um, that's just pointing to the Coca-Cola factory, the bottling plant in downtown Seattle. And then it's not being used as that now, but it was operational then. And then the words bag and production also point to a business in downtown. They point to the Bemis company, whose business is bag production. So <laughs> he, uh, some of them are just very straightforward. But then again, you can pick just any line. And let's pick the line, uh, he wear no shoe shine, he got toe jam football. The critical words here are toe jam and shoe shine. Because Toe Jam is a reference to the place known as Toe Jam Hill, which is the highest point on Bainbridge Island in Puget Sound. And it's just a quick ferry ride from downtown. And then Shoeshine is referring to the Sephardic Shoeshine men of Seattle. And as it turned out, in the beginning of the 1900s, um, there were many Sephardic Jews immigrating to Seattle. And I didn't know this, but Seattle had the largest group of Sephardic Jews outside of New York for many, many decades. Well, all of these Sephardic Jews who were immigrating were able to immediately start making a living thanks to the Jewish committee, uh, community because they were given a chance to shine shoes and repair shoes as they're living. So there was a very large group of Sephardic shoe shine men. And then... Taking another line, um, we have the line, he got Ono sideboard, he won spinal cracker, and it's Ono and sideboard and spinal and cracker that are important here. And a lot of people hear that line and they just assume logically that it's talking about Yoko Ono, but it's not talking about Yoko Ono. The fact that the word Ono is followed by the word sideboard suggests a very different meaning. And uh, Ono means tasty or delicious in Hawaiian. And as it turns out, 
Hawaiian food has always been very popular and prevalent in Seattle. And um, there was an elaborate restaurant that was just down the waterfront from the Beatles Hotel called the Polynesia. It was a very dramatic looking restaurant with tiki theme building and uh, it was embellished with Hawaiian lava rock. And you could get all sorts of Ono cuisine, Ono meaning again, delicious and tasty, Hawaiian cuisine on a buffet or a sideboard there. And uh, it that wasn't the only place, but that may have been the first place that uh, the Beatles thought of or whoever thought of. Uh, when they came up with this clue. But what's interesting is I looked around Seattle and there are all sorts of restaurants that still reference Ono cuisine. And uh, they, I, I wrote down a few of them, Ono Hawaiian barbecue, Ono poke, Ma Ono's, and they all continue to feature Ono Hawaiian influenced dishes. So that's the Ono sideboard, but in the same line, we have Spinal Cracker. And Spinal Cracker, uh, points to Seattle because it is pointing to the great martial arts superstar, Bruce Lee, whose home was Seattle and who started his business in Seattle. His first two uh, martial arts studios were in Seattle. And I didn't know this, but a spinal cracker is a fighting technique where you grab uh, the person from behind in a choking embrace and then ram the knee into the back of his spine. Well, uh, no com comment on that other than... Well, it sounds very martial. Yes. Artsy. <laughs> <laughs> other than Lee grew up here. He uh, he went to uh, Washington and opened his business here, and he is buried here. So he is a big star from Seattle. Yeah. So then we come to Holy Roller, which is one of my favorites. Uh, <laughs> Holy Roller is the clue that is referring to that notorious Seattle crime I mentioned. And that would be the Holy Rollers killings of 1906 in Seattle. So this is an interesting story about a man who had been working for the Salvation Army, but who had left that. And he suddenly declared himself a prophet and started a religion. I believe we've heard that story before. But this religion was, quickly became known as the Love Cult. And the reason it became known as a love cult is marriage was deemed unnecessary and respecting anyone else's marriage vows was also deemed unnecessary. And they got their name, the Holy Rollers, by rolling on the ground in a state of ecstasy. So Craftfield attracted mostly women and girls to his cult, and they acted as brides of Christ and engaged in sexual relations with him. Well, some of these women were married and some of the girls were very young. So needless to say, that upset the fathers and the um, husbands of these women and girls. And so the unsurprising result was the murder of Creffield and also a man who was involved with it, followed by two suicides among the beguiled women. And this was a huge scandal at the time, as you can imagine, in 1906. But that's where Holy Roller comes from, <laughs> was the Seattle Holy Roller killings of 1906. So again, there's still more clues and come together and that there are clues sprinkled all throughout the other songs and I mean, Seattle clues. And then there are at least three songs that are just one big Seattle clue. But um, I thought we better get on because you can carry on with these Seattle clues for all, forever, it seems like. But uh, once I realized that there were all these Seattle clues, then the next question was, okay, what do they have to do with Paul's replacement? Um, you know, did so it, Sharon, just to, to pause for a second here. So what made you look at Seattle to begin with? Because most people would just assume that Paul died over in England, in London, London area. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. what made you say, no, I don't think so. I'm, I'm going to go take a look on the West Coast in the United States. Right. <laughs> <laughs> well, um, Again, I was just I just was suddenly looking at the, the lyrics to "I'm the Walrus," and that's that was the start of it. And I kept seeing these words, and since the lyrics didn't make sense, I was just trying to make sense of the words. And then I remembered that the Space Needle was known as America's Eiffel Tower. Yeah, and I knew they weren't talking about Paris. And um, then the Walrus, I knew about the Walrus Building, but I haven't been to Seattle since I was fifteen, so. I really didn't know about a, a lot of it. There was also a third clue that that tipped me off. And so that's when I started researching 
the other words that were in Seattle. And I thought, I wonder if these are also clues to Seattle. And that's how it got started with the help of Glass Onion, which again, also points there. So that was really it. Okay. I was just curious mm -hmm. because yeah. um, it's very interesting what you're laying out here. Mm -hmm. So the question then is what all these Seattle clues have to do with Paul's replacement? Uh, since I am the walrus definitely indicates that he was replaced and it must have something to do with Seattle since that's where the song points. So it, uh, since I am the walrus is on magical mystery tour, that seemed like a good place to look next. And it turns out it was the place to look next because magical mystery tour contains an entire story of Paul's death and replacement. And um, that certainly wasn't obvious to me until I started getting into this. Then the later albums all have clues that tell uh, uh, retell parts of the story that are in Magical Mystery Tour, and they add a lot more detail. But I, but Magical Mystery Tour itself is all about Paul's death and replacement. So, and I wanna define what I mean when I say Magical Mystery Tour, because there is the movie Magical Mystery Tour, and it had six original music tracks, including one instrumental. And it also has a song sung by Billy and his former band, the Bonzo Dog Doodah Band, at, called Death Cab for Cutie, which is a very important song in this story. And then the other songs are uh, Magical Mystery Tour, the song, I Am the Walrus, Blue Jay Way, and um, Fool on the Hill, and Your Mother Should Know, and then the instrumental track, Flying. But when the American album was released, they added five songs to the six original tracks, and they did not include Billy's song, Death Cab for Cutie. So the ones that they added were added for a very important reason, because they tell critical parts of the story. And those are Strawberry Fields Forever and Penny Lane, and Hello Goodbye, and All You Need Is Love, and let's see what the other one was. It was Baby, You're a Rich Man. So the movie, and then the extra songs that are on the album, and then there are six music videos associated with songs from Magical Mystery Tour, and those are I Am the Walrus, Death Cab for Cutie, Fool on the Hill, Strawberry Fields Forever, Penny Lane, and Blue Jay Way. And those videos are very important. And the final thing that I include when I'm talking about Magical Mystery Tour is the album cover and the booklet that was inserted into it, because all of this material is just overflowing with clues that tell the story. And it all has to be considered together in order to get the full story. It, uh, it, it, everything that is there is essential to the story. So, um, it's Im important also to emphasize that while the film and the music videos contain uh, special clues and uh, they help explain the songs, the visual clues that are in these videos are actually the most explicit clues. So they are, they are very important. You cannot solve this without looking at these six videos. Just uh, another thing that, that I wanted to point out is just like memoir says that the Beatles songs have multiple layers of meaning. This yes. movie has multiple layers of meaning. And as you know, I don't know if you're, if you have seen the magical mystery tour movie anytime recently, I certainly hadn't. It's been a long time. <laughs> I went back and watched it because I just, it's not uh, one of my favorite <laughs> movies no, to watch. <laughs> no, I thought it was boring. Uh, the first time yeah. I saw it, I thought it was very boring. And apparently a lot of other people did too. And that's why it was a commercial favor failure, even right. though, the soundtrack was a big success. Yeah. But then I began to realize that the reason it's kind of boring is that just like I am the walrus doesn't make sense, but it's uh, it's because it's a huge collection of clues. It's the same is true of the entire Magical Mystery Tour movie. And on the surface, it tells what Billy describes in memoirs as the cover story, or at least one version of the cover story. And Billy claims that it takes viewers on a bus tour to a site in London where Paul died in a fiery automobile accident back in 1966. And, and you know that story very well. That would be on September 11th in the evening. And he admits in the book that that's just a cover story. And the cover story was obviously put out because 
even though the public was supposed to believe that Paul was still alive, uh, the, the people who knew Paul personally would have known that that wasn't Paul. Right. Somebody was impersonating him and something had to happen to him. So they needed a cover story so that they could pretend that what happened to Paul was something benign. It was just an accident and nothing else. And so on the, the surface level, Magical Mystery Tour does begin to tell this cover story or seems to be telling the cover story. And it does show that uh, that the Beatles take a, and their, and their gang, take a bus tour to this uh, place where Paul supposedly died in this car crash in London. And it was, again, it was on the outskirts, the Dewsbury Road. Right. But, or at least at the outskirts at that time. And uh, so that he appears to be telling the truth that that's what it's meant to say on the surface. But beneath the surface, the clues tell a completely different story. And just by way of example, in the Magical Mystery Tour movie, there is clearly a very big clue that Paul actually died in a mountainous region. And uh, so that clue involves the instrumental track Flying. And uh, in the on the bus tour, they show a scene where the people on the bus are directed to look out their window. And when they look to the left, they don't see anything strange. They just see the countryside. And then when they look to the right, they see scenes out the bus window, which were obviously taken from a plane. And they show a plane or they show scenes that were taken from a plane flying above mountains and then flying above clouds. And they show a lot about these mountains in this movie. And so the question is, what do these mountains have to do with this bus ride? And we're seeing the tops of the mountains. So they're clearly, these images are being taken from a plane. Well, um, what's interesting is that there is, the soundtrack has flying, the instrumental piece, and flying is what is playing at this particular time in the movie. So there's a clear suggestion that if you really wanted to get to the place of Paul's death, you can't get there by bus, you would have to fly there and fly to a mountainous region in particular. And later clues, and also some other clues in Magical Mystery Tour, tell us that, that those mountains that are being shown in that movie are actually the Cascade Range east of Seattle. And there are very clear clues pointing to it. I mean, there, there are a bunch of clues, so it's, it's not like I can just pull out one and say what it is, but they definitely, I'll lay it all out in the book for sure. Anyway, um, again, this movie and the videos give the most ex explicit clues, and the videos are the best at giving clues as to what really went on. So um, since the Seattle clues really are maybe less than 4% of all the clues in here. It's a very large network of clues. So it's obviously impossible to tell you the whole thing, but I do want to point out some important things about what where this puzzle goes and what it says. Okay. And the first thing I want to point out is the Blue Jay Way video and the Blue Jay Way song, because it is very important, because it's this video and song that tell us, that answer the question, what does Seattle have to do with the replacement of Paul? And um, so this video and the song both begin with George singing about um, the fog that has descended upon L.A. There's a fog so upon we know, L.A. Yeah. yeah, so no, we know right from the beginning that he is in L.A. in this song. And uh, so and I wanted to give some background on what the Beatles were doing that helps explain the Blue Jay Way video. So the Beatles flew into Los Angeles on August 24th, 1966, and had a day off. And the idea was that they were going to rest at this house that Brian Epstein had rented for them for several days. Um, this was on Curson Terrace. Uh, you know, I think the name is symbolic too, but that's a whole other story. But this house was at uh, in the general Laurel Canyon area, but that, that doesn't mean it was precisely in Laurel Canyon, but was in that area. And Blue Jay Way is a street that's just several streets away from this house. And allegedly, George is supposed to be singing this song from this house on Blue Jay Way that was rented by the Beatles' entourage. So they did go to Seattle on the 4th, and they did have a day off. 
And they were supposed to, on the next day, the 25th, fly into Seattle to give a press conference and then two Seattle concerts. And then late at night, they were to fly back to Los Angeles. And then the idea was that the rest of the time, they would just spend time relaxing in Los Angeles with only one interruption, which was that Dodger Stadium concert. And then on the 29th, they would fly to San Francisco for their final concert. So they did fly up to Seattle on the 25th, and they did give the two concerts, but things did not go as planned. So when they went to the airport late at night, the plane was supposed to leave at 11 on the 25th, but it was delayed for five hours. And the official story of that delay is that it was being delayed because of a worn out tire that had to be replaced. Well, I don't particularly believe that story. <laughs> and one of the reasons I don't, I mean, it could be true, but I mean, I just, uh, I don't believe Seems it. Seems like an awful long time to yeah. change a tire. <laughs> exactly, exactly. So, um, but the interesting thing is that there was a witness on that plane and he gave an interview to the Seattle paper, which is the Seattle Post Intelligencer. And this happened shortly after the incident. And he told a very different story. And that uh, person was Barry Tashian of The Remains, again, the opening group for the Beatles. And um, he, the Seattle paper claimed that the plane actually taxied down the run runway at 1130, but that there was a long delay. And when Barry Tashian was interviewed, he said that what happened was that someone stood up on the plane and demanded to be let off the plane because he had heard a backfire of an engine. And uh, Tashian said he was just amazed that the pilot turned the plane around after it already started taxiing out and went back to the hangar. And when they did go back to the hangar, several people got off the plane. Now, he did not mention Paul. He did not mention any of the Beatles except George because he was with George. He was with George on the tarmac and he was with George uh, later on the plane. So it's very interesting that this is not part of the official story. No one mentioned this, but the idea that this, the plane would start taxiing out and then suddenly somebody would stand up and say, I want to get off this plane and that the pilot would succumb to his wish and that several people would get off it was very, very interesting, I thought. So whatever really happened there, the clues in the Blue Jay Wade uh, video point to this long delay at the SeaTac airport. And they illustrate that Paul disappeared somewhere around 12 midnight on the 26th or later. It's just within a, a couple of hours that he seems to have disappeared. And they it also indicates that John was left at the airport too, but that Ringo and George eventually got on the plane back to L.A. And they were told that John and Paul would father, follow soon. And this is, again, all laid out in clues. It's not just, you know, guessing. So Sharon, so, just my own edification. So what, what do you think actually happened? Why did the plane come back to the hangar? Why did it stop taxiing and turn around? It's possible since it didn't start taxiing till 1130 that they, uh, and, the, and the paper definitely indicated that all four Beatles were on the plane. Yeah. Now, it's possible that what happened since it was 11 o'clock flight is that they were deliberately delaying for a while so that people really wouldn't be aware of what was happening. Um, you know, there were always fans around. And if once the plane taxied out, you know, they couldn't necessarily see what was going on or know what was going on. And um, I mean, they could have, but uh, that was one way to obfuscate was just to wait a long time. And uh, eventually people give up or they don't pay attention. So I think what happened is that someone orchestrated that, that they, it just doesn't make sense that how many times do you get on a plane and suddenly, you know, somebody stands up and said, well, you know, I don't want to be on this plane. Let's go back. I, I just don't believe right. that it's very likely that that was an accident. But it was after that point that Paul seems to have disappeared because when people got off the plane, he was never seen again after that. So and the, do we know that Paul and the rest of the band were actually on the plane? Yes, we do know. That. Or at least that was reported. That's what the, was reported. Yeah, okay. Uh -huh. So when... Yeah. The, when and also plane, Barry Tashian said they were on the plane. Okay. So when the plane came back, the only Beatle scene was George? Is that what you said before? The only Beatle scene was George. 
Okay. Uh, by Barry Cashian. Uh, he didn't he didn't mention Paul. He didn't mention any of the other Beatles. But the clues in the Blue Jay Way video show that Ringo was on that plane, too, back. Okay. But that George and Paul were not. And uh, so the whole Blue Jay Way song is about later that morning when George is back in L.A. And he's been told that John and Paul are going to be there at a certain time. And he's waiting and waiting and they don't show up. And you can hear the anxiety building in the song when they don't show up. And finally, uh, John comes back, but Paul, they never see Paul again. So that's what the whole Blue Jay Way setup is. It's telling you that that's where Paul disappeared. And um, John doesn't come back right away either. I mean, it's not clear exactly when, but he was definitely there with Paul during the next couple of days. So anyway, um, this this video doesn't end there. It also makes it clear that Paul was taken, that he was killed in a satanic sacrifice, and that he was replaced by Billy. And they actually show Billy, not you know some uh, caricature. They definitely indicate that it was Billy that replaced him. Now they say this in very they're kind of explicit clues, but they're not real de detailed. But what happens is that in the later videos. And in uh, later clues from other albums, they get much more explicit about exactly what happened. Uh, and they talk about all sorts of things about uh, who he was with and um, where he was. And uh, they take you on an odyssey around Washington State. But it, uh, it's important to remember before we start talking about that is that the Blue Jay Wade video is the video that tells you that he was taken or lured away from the SeaTac airport on in the wee hours of the 26th of August. So are you going to take us a little bit through the satanic sacrifice, how you came about, where you landed with that? Because some, some well, people, you know, will still say it's right, a car crash. It, it, and, exactly. And as, and as soon as you talk about, you start talking about rituals and the occult, uh, a right. lot of people just check out. So I was, I was yeah. wondering if you can explain that a little bit more. Well, um, there are three videos that actually show a demonstration <laughs> of a satanic sacrifice. The first one is Blue Jay Way, where they sacrifice a cello. And then there's uh, Strawberry Fields Forever, where they sacrifice a piano. And uh, then the Death Cab for Cutie video shows uh, a lot of detail that is more specific. And that it definitely indicates that this is a sacrifice performed by Satanists of the Aleister Crowley variety. And actually there is Aleister Crowley symbolism all throughout the Blue Jay Way video too. Uh, it's run kind of long and detailed and hard to describe, you know, just talking to you. And uh, I have three complete chapters on this. So on these three songs and, and the three videos that show these sacrifices, but clearly the cello and the piano are metaphors for Paul because they're both completely destroyed and there are elements of ritual, like in the Strawberry Fields Forever video, they show kettle drums and um, and a lot of other details that let you know that this is ritual and that it is satanic. So uh, I could go a lot further with that, but I- That's okay, that's okay. I was just, yeah. I just wanted to cover the, you know, the basics. And if we yeah. get around to it, maybe later right. on, we could talk a little bit more about it. Right, because the book does go, I mean, my book, does go into a lot of detail about what all this means and what these specific clues are. Okay. And uh, I'll have the link folks to the book down below in the description box. So I highly recommend that uh, you read it. So uh, what's interesting is the clues indicate that he actually, even though he was taken in the wee hours on the 26th of August, that he actually wasn't killed until the 28th at dawn. And so the clues will tell you, all that he was doing, who he was with. But what's really interesting is then they take you on an odyssey all around Washington State to different locations that played a role in the story of his death and replacement. And um, again, just everywhere you go, there is Al Aleister Crowley symbolism. So um, there's no question that the Satanists involved were of that variety. So the first place that the Clues take you after uh, he is taken and after they explain what he's been doing 
and ex they explain all about they flew in a, a woman from Liverpool <laughs> uh, to entertain him, among other things. So the first place, the first different location that they point to is the place where he was actually murdered, where the ritual sacrifice took place. And um, what's interesting is that when you take some of these clues and put them the, together, they give you specific driving instructions on how to get to this place. And then they point to different landmarks around the place so you can make sure that you don't miss it. They apparently want to make sure you don't miss it if you are this far in the puzzle. And then you'll know everywhere you go that you're in the right place because they, they, every important place in this story has very critical symbolism and or a highly meaningful name associated with it. So the, the clues that lead you to the place that he was killed uh, lead you to a very specific place on the edge of the Cascade Mountains. And um, j just to give you an example of the Crowley symbolism around this, uh, you know, the song Fool on the Hill. Right. Fool on the Hill is a big piece of Crowley symbolism. Fool on the Hill is about what Billy is doing immediately after the sacrifice. Because he apparently was there according to the clues and also according to the word stacking code in memoirs. And you have to wonder, why would he put that in there? And why would he insist that the part about Satanism in, in the book is all true if he wasn't there? I mean, it, it would be totally misleading. But there's so much that points to his being there. And the fool on the hill, the hill is referring to a, a place where the sacrifice and the replacement took place because they took place at the same time, which is why the song Hello Goodbye was recorded. It's telling you that Paul left the world at the same time that Billy takes over as Paul McCartney. Now, Sharon, do you have an example that you could point to uh, where you have evidence that Billy, um, are you saying he participated in the, uh, in the ritual? Well, actually in the book, uh, I talk quite a bit about this, and the first thing I do is point to some of the word stacking code. Would you like me to pull out the chapter and I can yeah, look at that? Yeah, yeah if, okay. if you'd like, if you'd like. I'm just mm -hmm. curious. Because mm -hmm. I'm not calling it evidence. I'm saying that Billy himself is pointing to that in this book, and that, uh, or, or Thomas Hugh Harriet, but allegedly based on it. And then that uh, the clues are indicating he's there. So, uh, and it's kind of hard to explain without explaining all the clues. And I know we don't have time for that, but. Um, no, I was just wondering if you had a quick example, something you could point to. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, so here it is. It's in chapter 14. In that chapter, the first thing I talk about is the death cab for cutie video. And there is a Billy-like character. It looks like it really is Billy, but he's got white on his face. So I just say Billy-like character. And he is dressed in a black ritual robe of the type that is used in Tholemic ritual magic. And um, so I point that out and that he, he is shown playing chess with the cute beetle, Paul, <laughs> who is the cutie in Death Cab for Cutie. And uh, it shows him making a final move and then smiling like he has won. And in this video, Paul is shown decapitated. He We see the headless person with the head sitting on the table. Which well, video was this? This is the Death Cab for Cutie video. Okay, got it. Okay. Yeah. These Some of these videos have very explicit clues. So um, let me just read this. In 1971, Paul McCartney released an album entitled Ram, along with his wife, Linda. And Memoirs claims that Ram stands for replacing a R McCartney and explains the Ram symbolism associated with sacrifice. In the book, when William explains his use of the symbolism of the Ram, encoded into his explanation are the words, I use the symbol to represent Paul and the shepherd. Paul is the Ram who was sacrificed and William is the surviving Ram, but he is also the shepherd. Then encoded into the book is the following message which is William or Billy's explanation of this. By now, you know about the ram to be sacrificed in the hands of the shepherd. And he's clearly saying that he is the shepherd. So it sounds like what he's saying is that Paul was sacrificed in his hands. And um, how could he be 
and then I ask, how could he be sacrificed in William's hands if William was not involved in the ritual? This just can't be dismissed out of hand since memoirs specifically emphasizes that the part about Satanism in the book is the truth. So if William wasn't involved in the ritual, why has he allowed these memoirs to suggest otherwise? And I ask, was he forced to participate? I actually think that's probably very likely. Okay. So, uh, but then I go on to explain that these clues actually back up what he is saying in word stacking code in the book. Um, that when he says that um, he is the shepherd and Paul is the ram who was sacrificed and that the ram to be sacri was sacrificed in the hands of the shepherd. So, you know, it's very gruesome. And some of these clues, especially the song Savoy Truffle, have some very gruesome clues. And I put them in a separate appendix for people who didn't want to read it. But I mean, there is ritual sacrifice, all satanic sacrifice all over these songs and videos, especially the videos. Yeah, I, that's I, whenever I talk about the occult with the Beatles, I, I forewarn my audience that this story has very, very dark elements. Yes, it's very grim. It's very you know, difficult it's for people to get their heads wrapped around, uh, you know, because of yeah. 60 years of the official yeah. story around the Beatles. When you start talking about occultism and rituals and Satanism, they just cannot, you know, they just step back, they recoil from it. Okay. And, you know, uh, the puzzle starts out, it almost seems fun. I mean, you're finding all these Seattle clues. Right. And you find clues to other parts of Washington, too. And it's, it almost seems just like an innocent puzzle until you really get into it. And the clues take you to the murder of Paul McCartney. In yeah. a very, uh, very tragic situation. So you you don't believe that he was just replaced. You believe that? Absolutely not. Okay. I, now, I do ask... And I do want to talk to you about that a little bit more because I, I do ask about, is this possible that it, this is a hoax? I don't believe it's a hoax because the clues in here are so specific that uh, if it was a grand hoax perpetrated by the Beatles, that would be very surprising. But I do want to talk to you about that some more. Sure. Yeah, I don't, I, did, I don't believe it's a grand hoax uh, um, yeah. as far as the story or the um, the mm -hmm. premise that Paul was, was replaced. Mm -hmm. uh, he was absolutely replaced. Yeah. There's no question that he was replaced. Right. Um, that is easily, easy to prove. It's what happened to him. Right. So um, what we do know, and, and again, there are lots of clues about what happened and some of them are gruesome. So I'll just let people read that for themselves if they want to. But again, it takes you to a very specific place on the edge of the Cascades. It tells you that these Crowley devotees, uh, Satanists, were involved and that there were lots of policemen involved. And that's not surprising since we're dealing with the PSYOP. You know, there are always policemen involved. And interestingly, at the end of memoirs in the lyrics section, Billy indicates in a, a, a set of lyrics called um, Flies and Bees to Emily that there were policemen who were paid handsomely and threatened. That is in the book. Now, is that true or not? Well, it seems to be borne out by the fact that the Beatles are constantly referencing and showing policemen in these clues. So, um, and I, I would like to, when we get to the end, talk about who set this up. <laughs> but there are definitely Satanists and there are definitely policemen involved. So the policemen apparently are there just protecting the operation and facilitating it, making sure nobody interferes. Oh, I know. I was talking about the fool on the hill and that Billy is the fool. He is the one that's shown in the movie uh, Frolicking on the Hill when the fool on the hill is played. And that would actually make sense if there really was a satanic sacrifice involving followers of Aleister Crowley. Because in Crowley's talk tarot, the fool is the beginner or the new initiate. That's right. And certainly uh, Billy would have been the new initiate in the role of Paul McCartney. So there is just there are just so many cases of symbolism like that from the Toth Tarot, from Crowley's Toth Tarot and, and other symbolism connected to him. But I wanted to mention before, before we go on back to some of the, a couple of these things we mentioned, 
that the clues after the murder start getting even more specific. And they are very, they're really very explicit. And they tell you exactly how the body was transported after he was murdered, the exact vehicle that was used. Um, they tell you about an important stop that was made in Washington state that was made along the way to the burial site. They tell you what the killers did to cover their tracks and make sure that anyone uh, that no one found Paul, but if they did, they wouldn't recognize him. And then there are specific clues that lead us right to where he is buried. And Abbey Road is the album that has a lot of clues about that. And so that's my last chapter. And uh, when you read that chapter, you will definitely know what the license plate on Abbey Road stands for. And, the, and just to give you a hint, the 28th is the 28th, the day that he died in that license plate. Um, and, and I think after reading the ch chapter, it'll be pretty easy to fill in the blanks of what the rest means. So in your book, Sharon, you will, because we're not going to be able to cover everything that's in your book, obviously. Mm -mm. So your book is will have the songs that will help people to understand about how it took place, where it took place, where they took the yes. body, all that. Yes, it is very specific. Where Exactly where he was killed, exactly where uh, they, how they transported the body, then what they did afterwards. They made an important stop and they talk about that. And then the clues again, lead you right up to where he was killed. And I thought, I just wanted to, I'm sorry, to where he was buried. And I wanted to mention something interesting because what I learned when I was figuring out the clues to where he was buried is there aren't just clues in the Beatles works from after 1966. William Campbell turned out to be a very deliberately planted clue as to where he was buried. And uh, that William Campbell, uh, for anybody who's listening that doesn't know, there were in 1969, the Beatles attempted to spread the rumors about Paul is dead. And uh, an article was published at that time. And it, the author was Fred Labour. And he told one version of the cover story. And he claimed that the man who replaced Paul was named William Campbell. And then shortly thereafter, he said, well, that re wasn't really true. His name wasn't William Campbell. And I made up some other things in the story. But the question is why? And now I think I figured out why, because there is a big clue involving the name William Campbell uh, that will lead you, uh, one of the clues that will lead you right to where he is buried. Is it a clue oh. that's in a particular song? No, this is... Uh, uh, when you put the name William Campbell with all the clues that are in the song, uh -huh. you will find the exact place where he is buried. And so okay. in the book, I lead you through all these clues and I lead you right to these places. Okay. Uh, including, I, and I was even surprised that I found the exact place he was buried, but um, that's what it, that's what it shows you. Okay. I don't want to upstage your book. Um, so, um, so if you can't, if you don't want to answer this, that's okay. Is uh -huh. Paul buried here in the States or is he buried? He he is buried in the States. Okay. And in fact, he is buried in the state of Washington. Okay. Mm -hmm. Yeah. You never leave the state of Washington in this story. Mm -hmm. I see. Okay. So um, anyway, I, I was just kind of trying to summarize what's in there since there's no way I can lay out the clues, you know. In our no, I know. Like that. And a lot of them you have to see because they involve these videos. Yes. But um, I started thinking to myself, okay, again, is this? Could this possibly be a hoax? I don't think so for several reasons. The first thing is that actually this story kind of rings true when you think about all the other rock groups who have been involved in the cult and in Satanism and all the early deaths of rock stars. And also the idea that you have all these intricate details, all these intricate clues as to Paul's death and replacement throughout more than three years telling this very intricate story also rang a bell because the Beatles advertised right from the beginning with their occult symbolism on their album covers that they were somehow connected to the agenda of the Illuminati. And of course, telling the truth in a way that most people can't understand or that most people won't even pay attention to is a hallmark of the Illuminati. So given that, is it likely that the Beatles were just fooling us with this incredible, incredibly elaborate puzzle? Or 
is it more likely that they were going to extraordinary lengths to tell the truth about what really happened to the original Paul McCartney? And I think that what they were doing was just putting the truth in plain sight. And it's been in plain sight for all these years. Yeah, so, and it's it's buried under um, just a, a ton of occultism. Mm -hmm. And until you start digging into the occult aspects of the story, mm -hmm. you're not going to truly understand um, mm -hmm. the possibilities of what may have or did take place. That's the thing. It's what I was talking about before, because whenever you get into the occult aspect of the story, um, most people just shut down. Yeah. You know, yeah. They don't want to hear it. They don't want to know about it. Um, you know, They'll go so far with it. But when you hit that point, a lot right. of people just back off. That's right. Well, when I start going through these clues and I keep explaining over and over again, all these different clues that point to Aleister Crowley and to satanic sacrifice, because I mean, obviously we couldn't go into them here, but there are chapters that are just exposing all this. I really think it's very hard to deny the, the bulk of clues pointing to this are just incredible. Yeah, I mean, all we have to do, if, if you want to get a picture of Crowley and Thelema, is to take a look at the Help album. Look at the front cover. That's right. Oh, speaking of the Help album, <laughs> um, as you know, there's a hint in memoirs that Maxwell Knight was the person who orchestrated all this for the elites, who orchestrated right. this, this murder and the cover-up of the murder also. And at first when I, I thought of that, I thought, well... <laughs> Is that really possible? I mean, here's this prominent spy master, you know, but the more I looked into the more I realized it's very possible because I didn't realize that um, Maxwell Knight was actually good friends with Aleister Crowley. I knew he had recruited him yes. for a job in World War II, but he was very good friends with him. He actually became his pupil and started attending his adult, his uh, occult ceremonies. And he was initiated into the AA, which is the very organization that uses the ritual magic positions that the Beatles illustrate on the Help album. So um, it's very possible. And not only that, but he obviously must have known Billy personally, because regardless of who Billy's father is, you know, whether it was Crowley or somebody else, I know the, the book hints at Crowley, but you made a couple of very good points that maybe that's not true. Well, you have the whole Kenneth Anger connection as well yes yes and kenneth anger was you know the uh, the heir apparent to crowley after crowley mm -hmm. passed away in 1947 right um, mm -hmm. you know so there is like i said there there is definitely this a uh, dark occult thread right that runs through the story you know and another thing that i thought of is you know actually someone in in uh Knight's position would have been the perfect person because, first of all, he had the assets of MI5 to employ, so he had plenty of money to use. He plus also the, plus had, the CIA. See, yeah, that's the thing. That's that they're, right. all, they're all interconnected. People think right. that they're separate entities. Well, they are separate entities on paper, mm -hmm. but the MI6, MI5 work with the CIA, with the FBI, with Mossad, and so on. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It's all interconnected. It is all interconnected. And so not only did he have plenty of resources to use, but he also had the power to make his threats to the policeman uh, credible. So then he also had the direct uh, connection to the Crowley followers because he was involved with them. And he certainly knew Billy and would have wanted to probably further their goals since he was one of the cultic elite himself. So, I mean, there are a lot of reasons to think that when Billy points to Maxwell Knight or when you Harriet points to Maxwell Knight, that that actually could be very true. It could be true. Yeah. Yeah, I agree. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And for folks that think that um, they can't get, they cannot get police to stand down. One of the examples I use is the uh, Monterey Pop Festival that kicked off the Summer of Love in 1967, mm -hmm. where the CIA was wanted to experiment with LSD to the participants of the, the concert. And mm -hmm. they told local police to stand down. Don't arrest anybody. We're handing this stuff out. Let it go. And, you know, we see this all the time where 
local police are told to take a back seat um, because the uh, the CIA is involved or MI6 is involved. Um, this is you know this is the reality of what really goes on when we talk about deep state stuff. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and so, occultism is a huge piece of the deep state. That's something yeah. else a lot of people really can't get their arms wrapped around. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so. Well, well, there's so much more to this, but I was just kind of giving an introduction. Um, oh, it's fabulous, Sharon. It really is. I, I love research like this. I mean, you're breaking new ground. And uh, it's up to the individual person who's watching this to buy the book, buy your book, read it, um, and they can decide for themselves. Mm-hmm. But... Uh, you know, one thing I've learned with this uh, with this conspiracy is you, you got to be careful when you make very definitive types of statements, right? You know, because new information can come about tomorrow. That's Billy, right. Billy could do a new song tomorrow with with a bunch of clues mm-hmm. that's going to you know put you in a different direction. But uh, no, I think it's it's great. Um, you know, I have to be honest with you. I haven't spent a lot of time looking into uh, where Paul died um you know of course i read the book and they talked about they lead us to into uh, england uh into the london area i did hear about as you mentioned earlier in the uh, the discussion about some researchers saying that uh it took place in the united states i never discounted any of that um mm-hmm. because i i don't know you know we mm-hmm. really don't know so it's always wonderful when researchers like yourself um do the work that you're doing to shine some more light and it opens the aperture. Mm -hmm. And um, I know that the occult part is very hard for a lot of people. But one of the interesting things in these videos is they're constantly, I mentioned they're constantly showing Aleister Crowley symbolism, but they are showing it specifically in connection with these images that show sacrifice. And for example, in the blue Jay wave video, uh, this during the scenes during the sacrifice and replacement, John is wearing this giant sunflower around his neck. And if you didn't realize what that symbolized, you'd think, this is just crazy. I mean, why is he wearing this? But the giant sunflower is pointing to the sun card in the Toth Tarot. And that is very important because the meaning of that card, it can symbolize sudden death, which of course is Paul's death, but it can also symbolize the gain of riches and fame, which of course was what was happening to Billy. And uh, so throughout that, you see incidents of that and it it keeps hammering so that even though it's very hard to believe when you first start out, it just keeps being hammered over and over that this was ritual sacrifice related to Crowley Satanists. It is disgusting. Don't get me wrong. (laughs) I'm not pleased with it, but. Well, let me ask ask you this question um when um some people will well not some people a lot of people ask the question when they start looking into the conspiracy they'll say well are you saying that the rest of the beatles just went along with this so when you get that question i'm sure you've gotten that question what's your answer well first of all the people controlling the beatles were obviously very powerful and when they saw what they had done to Paul, I certainly realized what could happen to them. But uh, I do go into, in the book, what happened to John afterwards, because he seems to have fallen apart, which is why we suddenly saw all these uh, impersonators of John afterwards, you know, the one with the hook nose and all these different <laughs> noses that show up on John. Yeah, But he was obviously devastated. And um, there was... Yoko Ono was brought in to control him. There's no question about that. I do go into that in the book. And he was controlled by using heroin, which is, a, you know, just a terrible thing. And in one of George Harrison's later songs, they, he talks about how they just treated him like a dog. It was a tribute song that he, I think it was in 1981. I've forgotten the title of it, but I do have it in the notes in the book. And he talks about how they just treated John horribly like a dog. I mean, there's no question he was controlled. He was threatened. And I real, I think the reason that George, who was Paul's other real close friend from childhood, the reason he survived is that he left and he got, he was very involved with religion and he just flew the coop afterwards for a while. And, um, 
so I think that's how he survived. And of course, Ringo, poor thing, he went in, he, you know, he was drinking heavily and uh, <laughs> went into rehab, but it must have been very terrible. But they, if you look at what they say afterwards, they make a lot of references to how miserable they are. And of course, Ringo wasn't the close friend that um, George and John had been. I mean, he was he was a friend, certainly, but he didn't have that long history. Clearly, if George had not had the religious uh, aptitude, I should say, uh, I mean, he was using that to help himself deal with this because he was brokenhearted. And you can see it not only in the songs that he wrote, but in, when he was with the Beatles, but in later songs. And in those later songs, John and George and even Billy put all sorts of clues to continue this story. I mentioned a few of them, but. Uh, what do you think of John Lennon's song, How Do You Sleep? Because that's the quintessential mm -hmm. Paul is Dead I'm, song. He just laid it all out. I'm glad he wrote it. I'm very glad. I know that people got upset over it, but I'm so glad because he was just uh, telling the truth. I mean, he just, how do you? How, and I believe that one of the reasons that uh, he wrote that is because not just because Billy seemed to be controlling everything after the murder of Paul, but that it's like, okay, wait a minute. You went along with this. How could you go along with this? Because I don't think John willingly went along with this. I think the evidence shows, just as you were saying, that he was under a mind control program, which I know also sounds ridiculous to people until they get into it and study what was going on uh, with the Beatles. Yeah, I, 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 you know, talked about the possibility of all of them being in mind control programs early on. Mm -hmm. And like you said, uh, a lot of people uh, don't want to hear that either. But, mm -hmm. You know, uh, the Beatles were a deep state operation. And uh, whenever you're a deep state operation, there's all kinds of stuff that goes on that's nasty. Mm -hmm. Plain and, and they simple. all knew they would be killed if they talked about it. There was no question about that. And uh, so... Uh, Probably a it, sigh of relief, would you say, Sharon, once uh, Billy wrapped everything up with the band uh, after Let It Be... Absolutely. There had to be a, a moment where they all said, you know what? Uh, mm -hmm. I'm really glad that this is done. Yeah. And all three of them gave indications in the things that they said that that, that was the case, that they were very glad to be out of it. And who wouldn't be? I yeah. mean, it had been this beautiful thing that just got blown up and they were all terrorized. Yeah, it was interesting. I, I did some uh, commentary on uh, Peter Jackson's uh documentary on, on let it be and it was a scene in there i remember um where uh, they were in the studio and billy's talking to them and he's talking in terms of taking the band forward and what i remember it's very very clear in my mind as he's talking the other three don't say a word mm -hmm. in other words what's implied is we're not going forward mm -hmm. <laughs> we're done we're right. done mm -hmm. so uh but um Look, just uh, is there anything else you wanted to finish up with? Because it's been a fascinating uh, discussion. I, I've enjoyed it tremendously. Oh, I've been, uh, just enjoyed being with you. I've been a fan of your videos for a long time. Well, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, I, I can't really think of anything specific. Is there anything you want to ask me? No, I, well, I can ask you where people can get the book. Oh, well, uh, I sent you some links. I don't know if they will be underneath the video. One was Amazon. One was Amazon. They can get it from Book Baby, uh, and there's a link to that. They can also get it just about any bookstore. I mean, Barnes and Noble. Okay. Uh, any websites or anything like that for you? Um, Facebook pages. Uh, I, I where am people can on, catch up with you. I am on um, X. Uh, okay. A site for Forbidden Fruit, and uh, so uh, and it's at Beatles Puzzle. <laughs> okay. Okay. <laughs> It's my handle. So and what has been the reception? I guess I'll ask this question uh, to kind of uh, conclude here. What has been the reception to your work? Um, so far, it's been very positive. Good. But that's because the people uh, who I've been talking to are people who are interested yeah. in the subject. And um, uh, you, I think you saw my interview with uh, Dr. Fetzer. Yes, with Jim. Yeah. 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 And he's been interested in this subject for a long time. But he hasn't been focused on it the way you have. But he, he's definitely a very interesting person. 
I'm full of. Uh, but Jim doesn't want to hear about the satanic piece of it. <laughs> um. Well, I think he was just surprised yeah. by, that all you need is love. Yeah. It is a song that points to Aleister Crowley. Yeah. And his dogma. Yeah. That's the thing. Like we say, we were saying before, the, the occult piece of this thing is so embedded. Uh huh. It's, it's rooted into, into the conspiracy, into the story. So if you don't, you know, if you don't really understand it or try to understand that stuff, then mm -hmm. this, you're going to be surprised a lot. Yeah. You know? But if you, you know, if you keep an open mind, regardless of what you think about that part of it, this puzzle takes you to precise places. And so you can know exactly what happened, at least the Beatles version of what happened to Paul McCartney, to the original. Okay, so folks, I highly recommend Sharon's book, Forbidden Fruit, Solving the Hidden Puzzle in the Beatles' Works from the Psychedelic Era. And um, I've got my copy of it. And as I promised Sharon, I will read it. I, I have it in the queue. Uh, I'm ac right now, I'm actually reading a, a book, another John Coleman book on the Club of Rome. So as soon as I get mm -hmm. through that, then I'll, I'll get to your book. He uh, is but, such an interesting character. Yeah, he is an interesting character. Um, mm -hmm. You know, there's some people have uh, these pros and cons uh, based upon what people hear or what they want to believe about him. But there's one thing that, um, uh, that I fall back on is uh, his books are very good. And uh, what I've said to people is uh, read his books. And once you read his books, then... Uh, Tell me where he got it wrong. <laughs> you know, he, he got a whole lot more right than he got wrong. And uh, so that's kind of my barometer. But mm -hmm. in any case, Sharon, I want to thank you so much uh, for coming on the show. It's been an absolute pleasure. Oh, it's been a pleasure for me. And after you read the book, uh, you know, don't hesitate to email me if there's a question or anything. Sure. Absolutely. Or comment. Yep. Mm -hmm. I, I will do that. And I will read the book. I, I promise you. Mm hmm. Okay, so with that, Sharon, thank you so much. Hang on for a second here. Uh, let me stop mm -hmm. the recording and I'll catch up with you uh, after the show.